Hello, hello everybody, and um, I'm really happy to be in such a distinguished company. And the funny paradox is that, uh, you know, usually we politicians, and I'm a politician being proud about that, uh, my job actually, differently from many others. Um, the funny part is that uh, usually uh, we are lectured by PR experts how we should behave, so I take a great pleasure actually to bit lecture you how, <laughs> what you have to listen about. <laughs> And uh, um, the interesting part of this panel is actually not only the content, but it's always important to remember the form, just like my Japanese colleagues are telling. The form without content is just half of the success. And we must remember also the good timing. And the timing, as we know today, we are commemorating um, in 8th of May, the end of the Second World War, and looking through the prism of storytelling, of um, imagined communities, I must say that uh, probably this war and those sacrifices would not take the place if there would not be some special coincidences, a wrong stories in the mouth of the wrong storytellers. Because that propaganda, that great stories which were either Nazi or communist stories, they made actually this war possible and such a large number of victims. I will still come a little bit back to this because I will try to give you a slight insight into the idea of how storytelling and stories are intertwined with um, practical life and with such a term as imagined communities. Um, but before that, uh, I would say that uh, PR experts, advertisers, politicians, and actually many of us, business people, we have a lot of things in common. And this one thing, what we have in common was very much uh, distinguished by one of my former older colleagues when I was a young politician and entered politics. He told me, listen, we politicians, we are sellers of dreams. And we have to be capable to sell two things. First, when we are speaking to audience, we must make a vision and a dream how the life will look when you will elect me. And the second time, once I failed, I must be capable to tell why it happened like this, so you elect me second time. <laughs> so that's the mastery of story, because basically if you are practically looking through, through data to the success of politicians, usually we can say that politician is successful if he or she has about 30% of those promises fulfilled. That's fine. If it's less than 30, maybe not so good, but more than 30, it's actually not very possible. So um, now about storytelling. I still remember from my academic work, there was one interesting author, uh, which is not the only one which speaks about this, but he's speaking about imagined communities, and that is Benedict Anderson. So how the nation is constructed? How community is constructed? Nations, communities, any group is constructed by imagination. And the normal, modern nations, they could come, and there are many reasons why they came into life, but one reason is because at one day appeared the written world, not in the way of Bible, but in the way of printing technology. And that made possible people in Riga, Liepaja, Washington, Los Angeles, wherever we want, to wake up in the morning, take the same newspaper, read the same ideas, and feel the same idea about community. Because if we communicate on the same language, if we communicate uh, about the same ideas, we have it. Also before such things existed, once we have been constructing this um, uh, or, or speaking about communities. So one more idea what I have to tell you is that there is always a necessity for a myth. Doesn't matter is it reality or not, because at the end we will come to this reality and imagination, they are overlapping and, the, and imagination becomes the reality if you believe in this. That's a practical thing. If you very hard believe, it becomes truth. So also in former times, you could not imagine societies without great stories and great storytellers for the concrete purposes of consolidation, homogenization, uh, activization of population. Uh, if you are looking to our nations, we have such a national myth because there would not be possible Latvian nation without national myth. It is large places. Kalevipoeg, Kalevala, Maori uh, trip to New Zealand. A lot of stories anthropologists can speak about them. Um, if I have to speak about motivation and the storytelling, 
and, in, and politics. I suggest you to read one very interesting book, which is called uh, The Gates of Fire by Stephen Pressfield. He is a very great um, writer about history, war history, war heroism. And you know, in many ways, uh, nations and the war, it's very much intertwined because it comes together with heroism. And I can see also here parallels with our own Latvian history, any other country's history, and this book, uh, Gates of Fire. Just brief introduction. Gates of Fire speaks about all known history of 300 Spartans fighting Persians. And the idea is that why did King Leonidas choose those exactly 300 Spartans and not maybe 10,000 other ones because they were all brave? They were not chosen because they were braver than others. King Leonidas at that time knew very well that these 300 men are going to die. They're not coming back anymore. He also understood that these 300 men, in fact, they're more, but these 300 men will not decide the fate of Greece and Greek civilization, because there will be still many other battles on front. So for him, it was important what message this fight with ultimate death will leave on the Greek general population. So he chose the people not because of their bravery, but because of their, now all the supporters of gender equality, including me, listen carefully. He chose because of their wives. Because for King Leonidas, it was very important to see how the wives will take the death of their husbands. Will they mourn? Will they cry? Will they collapse? Or, with, or they will keep their spirit up? This is how he chose. Spartans died, wives endured, Greece won the war. Now, if you are looking to the Latvian case, and we can see what the great consequences, the storytelling and the behavior has on the nation. We have two great stories in our, in our political and military history in 20th century. One of the stories is so famous Latvian rifleman. Once we are looking at the movie, documentary movie of Podnieks, Juris Podnieks, I remember as a, still a school child from that movie that one of the Ukrainians in that time during the Russian Civil War and Revolution told, when Latvian riflemen came to my village, the enemy was there, they have been chasing the enemy, wherever they went, they never retreated. They were the ultimate heroes of this war, they were the elite, just like Spartans or Gurkhas or somebody else. So this gave the proud to the Latvian nation during the establishment of our first republic, if I can say so. And that actually made Latvians very famous also during the Soviet era, as far as the military, as far as many other things. But then we have a second story, which maybe some of my um, fellow, fellow politicians will, will not agree with me. And the second story is 1939. And in 1939, we have a famous politician who told, facing the threat of invasion, I will stay in my place, you stay in my place, we will not fight. Because of this not fighting, because of this different attitude, we are still fighting a propaganda war about freely joining the wonderful Soviet Union, about all these things. These are the consequences of political behavior where we can see the example of Leonidas, we can see example of the Latin riflemen, we can see example of Mannerheim in Finland, and we can see the example of government of women. And that is a consequence that we are paying today with our attitudes. Now, if we are speaking about, um, about um, today's situation and, 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 and war and propaganda war, I don't want to touch so much upon, upon um, current political issues because this is not a political dialogue here, we can do it separately. But if we are looking what Putin did in Russia after he came to power, he obviously is a smart person and Russian elite is very smart to know what they have to consolidate. What was he offering to the Russian nation after the collapse of the Soviet Union? He was offering a dream of greatness, just like Hitler did it after the First World War. He offered the dream of greatness. And how did he do? You are doing this by renovating the old symbols, 
by giving the old myth of the victory of the Second World War, by giving the same songs, the same celebrations, and these are invented things. All of the myths, or many of them are invented. It's not important, is this factual or true? This is for historians who can fight, did it happen or not. Politically, it's important how it works. So for him, obviously, it works. Because many Russians got back the feeling of greatness with this president. Many Russians really believe in all that greatness of this nation. And, and one sidestep a joke, what I heard somewhere about one Canadian going to Moscow um, and driving a taxi. And, and he speaks with a taxi driver, and the um, taxi driver is complaining in general about the life in Russia. And uh, he's telling, no, I, I'm tired here. I will emigrate to the United States. And then the Canadian is telling, well, why the United States? You know, Canada is maybe better, better social security. It's a little bit more similar to Europe. And the taxi driver is telling, you know what? Only United States. I am used and I want to live in empire. Mm -hmm. So obviously, <laughs> such a small country like Latvia has not much to offer to such type of mentality if we speak about integration. We can't offer such type of greatness. We can offer great freedoms. We can offer a great economy if we succeed. We can offer great beaches, but we cannot offer that greatness what can give empire. And this is the thing what makes, what is at stake now in Ukraine and in this war in Ukraine around it. Because if the current leadership of Russia fails in its propaganda by selling a dream of greatness, then all this pyramid is collapsing. If they are not failing, then they still can endure. So it's not about reality. It is about how we imagine this reality. And I think this is important what we have to remember once we are speaking about this. Now, uh, the maybe final part of my presentation is touching upon all those important things what we are using now, uh, iPads, iPhones, Twitters, Facebooks, uh, whatever, chats. We are not communicating anymore with each other. I don't know how we will do some more private parts in a while, you know, since, since we have now all these communication skills now. But uh, when Benedict Anderson was speaking about creation of nations and society and printed word, he was seeing this as a very consolidating part, which was consolidating the nation and society. Today, actually, this weapon of modern IT communication technologies can be used to consolidate, but it also can be used to disintegrate. And I don't know which is now, at this moment, stronger, because just one example, many of those who are dealing with this uh, should know this. In the 70s, for instance, if you needed to give a concrete governmental message, for instance, in the United States, for you to reach, let's say, 80% of public, you maybe needed two major TV <coughs> channels or something like this. Now, we are each choosing what do we, what do we want to read or what we don't want to read, so actually, we need to use much more channels. We need to use Twitter's, Facebooks to reach the same amount of people. So we cannot anymore consolidate through these skills. Secondly, already old Greeks told that if we want to avoid kind of inflammation of our brain and we want a stable democracy, we need not only inform people, we need to have people who are smart and who can analyze. So are we actually sure that since we have all these modern technologies, we are becoming smarter, we are becoming better capable of analyzing, or we are simply have more choices so we can avoid this analysis, or we, can actually, we are actually forced to assume something. So I think we must admit that uh, IT technologies, Facebooks, Twitters, etc., they are tools. They can be used to break the window, and they can be used also to construct a house just like the nuclear bomb. How this will be used and what the influences will be on society it is not answered. Obviously, the latest events around Ukraine, between Russia and, 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 and other world and other countries, shows that um, strategic communication is highly important and we need to find an answers how we can create not only more information availability, but also better capacity of analysis when we tell our stories. Story, and imagination, this is something which creates reality, not vice versa. I know the time now is running out. I will stop now.
Thank you very much. I hope that it was not totally wasted time. <laughs>